So it is a beautiful sunny day here at Dogwood Hall, and I thought I might step outside and shoot this introduction in front of the actual blooming dogwood tree from which I derived the name for my home. And so what we want to talk about today is um, a kind of follow on from the other video that I'm going to upload today. And I'll put a link to that video probably here or there, whichever side makes more sense. And uh, that has some other kind of tools that were developed by other people that apply the same way to, you know, using historical information to make fantasy campaign settings. But what I want to do in this video then is actually take some specific um, information sources uh, from history, uh, a doctoral dissertation, and uh, a town, an urban morphology study, and uh, take information that we glean from those sources and apply them to making uh, this campaign setting for which I've prepared a map and uh, blustery out here today. But um, we'll go through this map, uh, and I'll do that in the, the end part of the video where we'll, we'll go through the, the actual details that are on the map. And then we're going to derive our adventures from the things that we randomly rolled during a previous video on the quick pace system for developing campaign arcs. So we randomly rolled up 10 different uh, adventure arcs, each with their own sequence of um, foci that we could use in the creation of that adventure story or at least the background story this is not the story for the uh, characters for the player characters but rather the stories that are going on around the player characters the milieu within which they will make their decisions during play so i took the what we randomly rolled for that video and i've applied it to a lined piece of paper here uh, so we can go adventure by adventure and talk about uh, the details that we, we derive from the Pulte system and also from Tobias's 20 master plots for the overarching kind of uh, quest focus or, or general theme, major theme for the whole arc or for the whole adventure within that arc. And uh, so anyway, what we'll do at the start of the video is we'll go through those specific resources and then we'll spend the last part of the video talking about how I'm applying them to this particular map, which will form uh, the location for a uh, 10 adventure campaign arc that will ultimately be released for uh, general use. So um, at some point when we get through all these videos talking about the preparation process, it will become a video that you can download, or become a, a, an adventure that you can download and play for yourself. All right, so let's move back inside. So the unifying theme of this video and the other one that we released today about uh, setting up using historical sources to create fantasy worlds uh, is going to focus on cities and the rationale behind that is because as i go to convert the picardy region of france into a fantasy medieval setting for uh, a series of adventures to be unified into a campaign uh it's really the the cities there that i started converting first and so once i established what was going on in the major cities of that new setting then i kind of got a feel for what would be going on in the countryside which i also am taking directly from the region of france that we've talked about in previous videos picardy region um as far as it being you know chalk hills underlain by um a finer grain limestone which in turn is underlain by uh, a more coarsely grained uh, sandstone although that's at a great depth pretty much everywhere um so each of those places will have different resources when we get to the end we start talking about the the new map uh, showing the kind of converted area uh, we'll talk more about that what we want to do though is at first i'm going to start off talking about a few other historic cities from different regions um in, in a lot of cases, I'm actually taking ideas from some of these other places and applying them to my converted you know, campaign realm. And so the first one we'll look at is uh, medieval York in Northumberland, northern part of England. And um, so the opening slide here, what you see is uh, a drawing by E. Ridsdale Tate that shows York in the 15th century. 
and uh, the area kind of on the left side of the photo is the right bank of the Ouse River and uh, you would come in uh, past uh, you know during the medieval period anyway past one um, castle on your left hand side there uh, the old bailey uh, not much of that remains the the there is still a, the hill is still there uh, where the mountain bailey for the castle was but uh, it, it's not as well preserved as the castle on the other side of the river on the left bank and so you would go north on that along that road into um, the Micklegate area and then uh, across the the bridge that went over the river ooze and into what was then the main commercial district of York and from you know, once you got to the other side you could turn left and start heading towards what was the major cathedral in the city the minster or you could go right and start heading towards the other castle from the norman or um, high, the beginning of the high middle ages so just to run quickly over some of the developmental background of york itself uh it began during the period of roman occupation as the settlement called Eboracum. um and as kind of a note about the landscape in the general vicinity most of the streams in the area um, empty into either the Uus River or the Humber uh, both of which connect up to the North Sea uh, both of them can be ascended from the sea but uh, as we wear into the medieval period uh, the majority of the cargo was being dropped at the city of Hull and then making its way up to York along land routes but the city of York itself uh, continued to be a fairly major center uh, in terms of uh, second of the provincial cities only behind uh, Bristol for much of the medieval period. Uh, it had a peak in the 1300s and then in the sort of hundred years after the Black Death was a golden age for York and then it gradually started to decline a little bit until we got into the middle 1500s and then it would grow again but it always continued to be a, a major administrative center uh, for civic um, activities it always continued to be a major ecclesiastical center with not only the the big churches the churches in each of the many parishes throughout the town uh, but also a number of uh, monastic houses that were scattered throughout the town itself and we'll kind of run through a list of those uh, quickly because i don't want to have this video to drag on we're going to get the maps at the end but i did want to flash some of the the historic maps and then uh, also the last map we'll show here uh, real fast is uh, a much more recent uh, map from the archaeological work that's been done throughout the city of York and it you know, shows where some of the major archaeological excavations are on a fairly current map. So what we're looking at in this slide is uh, the colored map on the right is uh, the John Speed map of 1610 showing the general vicinity of York town. And then on the left hand side, what you're seeing is a breakdown of the different parishes within the medieval city of York, each with their own name listed in there. And um, just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the kind of power sharing arrangement. So obviously, as both a civic and an ecclesiastical center, um, you know, both lay government and church government were important to the overall governance of the city. Uh, in fact, there was kind of a contested power sharing arrangement between the two. Uh, the city itself was, for much of the time, um, governed by a council uh, consisting of a mayor and a number of aldermen and uh, at the upper end was kind of like 24 aldermen and these were drawn from the various merchant and trade guilds that were important within the city generally speaking um, now also uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about buildings and uh, throughout the these various parishes or neighborhoods that we're talking about um, for much of the city um, some of the churches and the monastic buildings were built of stone 
uh, only a couple of the civic government buildings were built of stone. The majority of the buildings in the city were constructed out of wood. And uh, then just kind of a population note here. Um, let me see. It's sort of the, the late 14th century. Uh, so that golden age that we were talking about um, following the Black Death the bubonic plague period um there were about 11 to 13,000 people living in the city of york and then as we got into that later period where it started to go into a slight decline uh the population dropped then to about uh 8,000 people in the mid 16th century so 1550s we'll say So where all this leads us then is to the PhD dissertation of Heather Crichton Swanson, uh, Craftsman in Industry in Late Medieval York. And this is really a useful document for a number of reasons uh, that we'll get into the, the nature and composition of the merchants, guilds, and sort of rough ideas about the types of merchants that were represented within the city. Uh, it's a little more difficult to establish the actual numbers of each particular trade or occupation that were there to serve the entire population of York. But uh, I wanted to give you a chance to look at this thesis now the study covers a period of time from uh, roughly 1300 until uh, 1534 so we're looking at that peak time and then also into the later population decline and the other thing is when we look at the tables and i'm not going to go uh, subject area through subject area um, in great detail to, to look at the nature of the information there if you wanted to set something in a, a city that you based on historical medieval york then it would be to your benefit to grab this it's free download from um, white rose and i'll put a link to it in the description for the video but uh, one of the reasons it's useful, first of all, we'll take a look at, you know, it breaks it down. I, and I, I very much like the breakdown that Swanson used as far as the, the top level headings for the way she broke down the uh, groupings of occupations and trades that were being used within the city. And so the first one is the textile craft, textile crafts, and fabrics, and uh, you'll, you'll go through to provide you with some information. And one of the more interesting things here, though, is uh, if we look at the totals, we go year by year. And like I said, um, so she'll build from the records of 1290 and then into the 14th century there. And we're looking at these overall categories, the top level groupings, textiles, leather, vitaling, metal, building and then the miscellaneous trades and then also the people involved in um, mercantile and transport the merchants and the people that were distributing the, the goods on behalf of the merchants or to the merchants also the agricultural sector uh, clerical and religious and we'll look at the footnotes to see what all that uh, entails gentlemen uh, will also be in the footnotes but just to make sure that's the the nobility the knights and then uh, other services so for the total breakdown, it goes through all the categories. And then here's the footnotes at the end that tells you what all is included. So in agriculture, it's not just the farmers, but it also includes things like the horse dealers. Uh, with clerical, um, you know, don't just the clerics is in D&D, &D, although it is including the religious and secular clergy, it's also including things like lawyers and clerks or, you know, potentially scribes, that sort of thing. So gentlemen, as I mentioned, include the knights. Services includes things like officials. So when we talked about uh, mayor and aldermen, uh, those would be included in the service category, uh, but also things like musicians and scriveners. So there's the scribes again. I guess scribing could be a, a service or a clerical work. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, people with no trade. So we'll go back through, um, I'm not going to cover, like I said, the actual things. So look at textile crafts. Here we have a whole list of people that were given entrance into, quote, the freedom. So they became free people of a 
you know, free tradesmen within a given occupation. And so, you know, you can see here this whole list of, you know, whether it's cappers, drapers, hatters, hosiers, linen weavers, uh, walkers or fullers, then that would trample on the cloth and they'll come up again to make it a more supple and usable fabric. Uh, weavers. Um, Anyway, so next category, leather. So we'll go all about the leather trade in York. And we'll talk about that again later when we get to uh, Anik, because um, that's going to be a, a, a major um, trade or, uh, basis of, of their economy once we get there. Uh, but anyway, to look at the table, these are all the occupations that are being included then in her general category of leather crafts. Same with the vittling crafts. Now, um, the vittling um, in this particular case could be used to mean cooks, you know, somebody who worked at a, a cookhouse uh, or, you know, probably not the restaurant or, you know, inn or whatever. But uh, it generally would apply more to people who were preparing foodstuffs and goods for military use. So uh, the food for the army and the navy. That's kind of the basis of the vittling crafts. But here we see that these are the people involved in the, the subcategories within the vittling trades. Uh, bakers, butchers, cooks, just like you'd expect. Um, and then we have the metal crafts. Go through the importance of metalworking to medieval York. Here are the people involved in the metal crafts. So whether it's, it's armors or, you know, bell makers and founders bladesmiths or card makers so people who make the metal combs that they use to card out raw wool um, that would be kind of a trade in and of itself uh, and then pewterers and locksmiths people who make spurs um, anyway so building crafts of course this is construction trades would go through uh, you know what was important in medieval Europe there in that chapter and then we'll take a look at the the actual building trades that were being considered the subcategories carpenters cartwrights carvers joiners sawers shipwrights turners glaziers masons uh, the bricklayers stone stone cutters i think it's in there might be that's in miscellaneous crafts um but also general laborers falls into that category and plumbers and then lastly we have a chapter that cover like everything that isn't covered by the other chapters in the miscellaneous crafts. And then here's the things that are being included. So, you know, what we have here is apothecaries, uh, physicians, barbers, uh, but also more basic things like chandlers, and fletchers, stringers, ropers, rope makers, um, coopers, so barrel makers too, horners, people who work with animal horns and make stuff like, you know, whether it's powder horns and the um, black powder era or you know simply a, a horn flask or something to carry with you as an adventurer and uh, so anyway uh, like I said this is uh, Heather Crichton Swanson's PhD dissertation is available for free download a great source of information about occupations and trades so before we get back to medieval Europe at another location, I just wanted to take a moment and say, you know, this doesn't have to um, apply to just the medieval period, and it doesn't have to apply just to European areas. Uh, so what I wanted to do was insert a, a couple of cards here about uh, Teotihuacan, which was a major city in Mesoamerica that began urbanizing probably about uh, 100 BC or so um, and then continued on as a, a, a fairly densely occupied urban region until uh, we'll say the 7th or 8th century AD so uh, probably by the early 700s or so it, it was uh, starting to decline as far as a, a definite population center uh for much of its peak it, it was uh from from after the you know of the the centuries ad we'll say from about 300 or on or so it was you know a sizable population of about 60,000 to 80,000 people at its very peak probably about 500 or so uh ad uh it was probably a hundred thousand or even more 
there was a definite uh, elite class and uh, most uh, or a large portion of the population about 25 percent was involved in uh, craft productions so um, one of the things we'll get back and I'll, I'll talk about in a minute let me show another slide here real fast uh, the second location that we want to talk about is uh, Monte Alban, which is about 300, almost 300 miles uh, south and a bit west of where Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan is near present-day Mexico City. Uh, Monte Alban is in the Valley of Oaxaca and very near to the town of Oaxaca. It was a, a defensive position on the top of a hill and uh, it was probably originally founded for that purpose, uh, to provide defense in a time when there were a lot of uh, minor skirmishes at the very least. There's evidence of you know, warfare being endemic uh, at a time. Uh, there had been villages in the general vicinity of where Monte Alban is uh, since 1500 BC. Um, however, it started urbanizing about 500 BC or so. So, you know, roughly 400 years before Teotihuacan, it was becoming an urbanized center. Uh, however, it uh, never really grew to the same size. Uh, let's say probably about, uh, you know, early on, it, it, it's maybe... 5,000 people that are living there. By, we'll say, 200 AD, the population had risen to about 15,000 people living there. At its maximum, about 500 to 750 AD, uh, 25,000 people there. Um, and then by about 800 AD or so, uh, its population had fallen back to about 4,000. However, it also continued to be an urban population center into probably the, the 9th century AD. Uh, so it continued on a little um, longer even than Teotihuacan. So it started before and ended after Teotihuacan, and yet was never as large. And interestingly enough, um, not as pronounced an existence of an aristocratic class so no not as much evidence for uh, a distinct class of elites uh, although there were some larger buildings towards the north end of the settled part of the urbanized settled area um, however the economy at uh, Monte Alban was a little different in that it was based on uh, agriculture uh, the so-called three sisters of maize beans and squash I'll typically, uh, sometimes you'll see sources, they'll say corn. I like to distinguish between maize and corn because prior to uh, the Europeans uh, discovering that there was another new world in the Americas, uh, they used the word corn generally to mean grains like wheat um, or even emmer or spelt, that sort of thing. So when they're talking about corn in the field, or, you know, barley corn is kind of another example that's survived into the present day as a reference. Um, so to distinguish one corn from another, I tend to call the what we think of as corn in the cob kind of corn uh, as maize, or based on its scientific name, the maize. So uh, now we'll go back to uh, Teotihuacan because we want to talk a little bit about this neighborhood of Tlalotocan. And it's uh, it's in a, these quadrants that we're looking at on, of Monte Alban are pretty large. They're 500 meters by 500 meters per square, and so um, this little neighborhood of Tlalotocan is in mostly uh, north one, west six. However, it also extends out uh, into the areas around that. So a little bit of uh, north 2, west 6, and also uh, north 1, west 5, and north 2, west 5. Uh, basically the north half, or most of the north part of uh, north 2, west 6, uh, or north 1, west 6, and then um, kind of the bottom half of north 2, west 6. And it's interesting in the sense that it was... Uh, about uh, a neighborhood of about 10 to 11 apartment compounds and that housed roughly 600 to 700 people 
And unlike the rest of Teotihuacan, or at least what's been excavated to this, uh, to this point, which is, you know, a lot, but not the majority of the site itself. And so it's interesting in that most of their material goods were just like everyone else's at Teotihuacan, except uh, they did have a higher uh, uh, instance of pottery of the Zapotec type. Now, the people who had settled originally at Teotihuacan were Toltecs. Uh, Toltecs were in the area. And then uh, the people at Monte Alban were Zapotecs. So what it looks like is this is a little ethnic neighborhood of Zapotecs living in Teotihuacan. And it's not exactly clear what they were doing. They might have been a little merchant enclave. Uh, and like I said, by and large, they were materially integrated in with, you know, just living like everyone else in the town. But they did produce their own styles of pottery. And it kind of suggests that in terms of food ways, they were still practicing the types of uh, meal production and consumption that they were used to from back home and whether or not they, you know, housed traveling merchants that were coming up from areas like Monte Alban and the Zapotec territory or not, uh, like I said, it's, it's still unclear. Now, there was also a, another neighborhood that's been discovered at Teotihuacan um, where there were people from around the area of what's present day Veracruz. Um, on the Gulf Coast. And so, you know, there's these little ethnic neighborhoods that are developing in the enormous city of Teotihuacan. And just kind of to mention, uh, there also appears to have, there's, there's modest evidence for uh, an ethnic neighborhood of Toltecs from Teotihuacan living in Monte Alban. And what's interesting is that they sort of come in um, later in the period, um, so, you know, we'll say after 350 A.D. or so, in around 500 A.D., where they, if, if, if it is supported, ultimately, it looks like they may have been living in the quasi-elite part at the north end of Monte Alban. Uh, like I said, there wasn't as much distinction between classes there previously. Now, whether that suggests that the you know, the political authority of Teotihuacan was extending to Monte Alban for a period, uh, whether, you know, if they had, like, ambassadors or um, people who were there to, uh, quote, rule on behalf of Teotihuacan for a period of time, that's pretty unclear. But it, it's, it's interesting that it suggests that there was, you know, little ethnic neighborhoods in all these urbanized areas made up of people from other urbanized areas throughout Mesoamerica at the time and whether you know they're conducting sort of these trade networks or what was going on but suffice it to say the point is that people were fairly well traveled at the time so they did get around and they were even migrating to other areas as you know Immigrant and living as immigrants in these other urbanized areas outside of their homelands. So then our next stop is going to be Anak in uh, Northumberland, England. And here we're looking at a view from the south looking towards the north. In the bottom center of the photograph, you can see that triangular area of the town's uh, market. And just to the north of that, then, you can see the castle and its distinctive double bailey. Uh, for the shell keep and we're looking at a photograph that's been draped over a digital elevation model and uh, shown with a vertical exaggeration of three times the actual so that you can make out some of the topographic features and that's why we'll look at our next view of it here we're looking from the northeast towards the southwest and you can see the castle in the sort of center right of the photo there and you kind of get an idea that it's sitting on a, a slight rise above the north end of the town but below what's going on at the south end of Anak and or, or just to the south of Anak proper and then uh, also on the bottom you can see here the River Al.
some viewers may recognize Annika Castle here uh, from its being used as a film location for many movies and television shows. Uh, it is probably most recognizable, I guess, that it's been used as Hogwarts uh, for the first couple of Harry Potter films. Uh, it was used in the most recent uh, Dungeons and Dragons movies as, as a filming location. Uh, it, older viewers may uh, recognize it as being used in the Kevin Costner and Robin Hood film from the early 1990s. Um, it's also been used in some television shows. Uh, recently, it was in Downton Abbey. Um, uh, probably one of my favorite uses of it is that it was uh, from the first series of The Black Adder, uh, a film location. The resource that we're going to look at for this particular section is going to be part of a town plan analysis that was done by uh, MRG Consen uh, in 1960. And Consen was uh, doing... He's one of the innovators of town plan analysis, and just to get into what he was thinking, uh, it was basically talking about three elements of a town plan. Uh, the streets and their arrangement was sort of part of the one of the stru primary structuring elements of street systems, as you might recall from uh, one of the resources that we linked to in our, the other video that we're releasing today, the companion to this piece uh, on medieval cities, that uh, streets are one of the structuring elements of the city. We're also considering what he's calling plots, the individual parcels, which are themselves bounded on at least one side by streets, and those uh, aggregate together into street blocks. And then lastly, under the heading of block plans, we find the actual plans of each building. And of course, there might be more than one building on, on a parcel, whether that's two different residences or if it's a building in a number of outbuildings. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, Anak and where it came from. It's in the north of England. Uh, it's not too far from the border of Scotland, which is one of the reasons why the castle was built here. Uh, it was also an important staging area on the Great North Road. So there's another callback to the medieval cities handout that we had from the companion video to this one. Uh, that one of the reasons for you know, settling a particular location might be things like uh, trade and travel along trade routes where there were important stopping points or the need for defensive positions. So both of those are true here in Anak. And uh, it was also a kind of good area to cross over, to build a bridge over the river Hall. And it was good in the sense that um, it is at the northeast end of the Anak Ridge. And uh, so it is also a bit northeast of the Aden Forest and the ridge line itself, but it's an area that sort of flattens out. And so it became a perfect place to build this town and this castle. All right, so now we'll go back and look at some overhead maps of Anak and uh, also call back to uh, an, the medieval cities handout from uh, the companion video to this one and think about the the structuring elements of a city and we you know we've already talked a little bit about streets as a structuring element but um, the other ones were residences which we have you know shown here uh, as far as uh, parcels where they would have occurred in different areas of, of the city or town and then we also have the marketplace uh, that triangular area in the middle of the walled section of the city. Uh, we have the civic building in the form of the castle. Uh, we have the defensive structures, the wall and the gatehouses. So we have you know three major gates into the walled section of the city. In the southeast, we have the Bond Gate. The southwest, we have the Clayport Gate. And in the northwest, we have the Potter's Gate. And uh, just north of the original Potter's Gate, there's another gate called the Narrow Gate. And that would uh, allow access to um, a built-up area just west of the entrance to Anak Castle. And that area was known as Bellygate, or written looks like Bailiff Gate. Um, and that, uh, you know, also shows uh, the, as M1 on the map to the left-hand side of this slide. Um, 
St. Michael's Church. So that's our religious structure. So all the ones that we mentioned in the handout from the medieval cities are displayed on this map. Um, and then the map to the right shows the kind of uh, structure of the field system around the town of Bannock. Uh, so there would be a mix here. Some of the fields were closed, some were open. Uh, in general, the Lord's fields were intermingled with the fields owned by the yeoman farmers in the area. So just as some final notes about these maps, then we'll go back and look at this map on the left-hand side. It's overview, uh, showing the town of Anak. And um, we'll look at the walled town just to the south of the castle there. And also the walled area just to the west of the castle uh, outside its entrance. Now, the neighborhood just to the west here, uh, Bellagate, or it looks like Bailiff Gate when it's seen spelled out, um, that was actually uh, believed to be administratively a, a separate settlement uh, from the main town of Anak. And it was primarily inhabited by people who worked at the castle. However, you also see there that there's some parcels that are marked with diagonal lines. Those are believed to have been apartments that were reserved for the use of visiting dignitaries. So like the, the Lord's vassals might be called in for a, a meeting or if he wanted to address them, uh, they'd have access to these apartments out here in the Bellygate neighborhood um, so that they could bring their household staff with them and remain outside the castle so that they could conduct their own affairs. And uh, then if we take a look at the uh, fields on the map on the right-hand side here, just wanted to note that uh, while there were crops being grown in these fields, uh, some of them are closed fields, some are open. Generally speaking, the Lord's fields are intermingled with those of the yeoman farmers. So the primary uh, economic driver, though, for the town of Bannock was actually livestock mainly cattle and so when you go in and look at the town for you some of the professions and trades that are you know in great abundance in the town of Anak are just what you'd think it's uh, butchers it's tanners it's fullers or walkers um, the walkers actually lived um, to the north and slightly west of the city um, of the town of Anak, uh, and out, but outside the main gates, uh, that was where they would, you know, the fields were open to trample on the fabrics to make them softer, which is what the fullers or walkers are actually doing. So, you know, again, it's, it's, it's agriculturally, I can't say completely self-sufficient, but mainly self-sufficient, but it was producing, uh, livestock cattle cattle and cattle byproducts like hides and treated leathers and just briefly before we leave Anak here then what i want to do is go back and look at the initial two views and uh, talk a little bit about some things we talked about in the mapping videos um, such as uh, make worse maps and play deeper worlds um, this is actually that paper map or the electronic versions of it that you saw in the previous view draped over the aerial imagery and the dig digital elevation model so that you can get a view of you know how the things shown on this map relate to the actual topography of that particular landscape so this is again um, the view from south side of town looking towards the north with the castle at the top center of the photograph and map image and then uh, again we'll just take a look at the next view which is uh, from the northeast looking towards the southwest so you know you're, you're you can see the river on in the foreground and then in the background what you're looking for is uh, Anak Ridge and or the Anak Moors and you, uh, if you could see that far, you'd also see the Eden Forest back down in that direction. 
Okay, so now we're just going to finish up by talking a little bit about some of the actual cities from the Picardy region in France that we're transforming into the cities that will be the 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 core focus or foci for our campaign adventures. So these will be the the major nodes that will be connected up by the countrysides and roads and that sort of thing. And so the first place that we'll look at is um, Kusi Castle and its associated town. Um, this would have been a town of roughly 700 people or so when uh, the castle was built um, by the Lord of Kusi, Angaran III, uh, in the AD 1220s. Uh, the castle was very rapidly constructed and at the time was the largest castle in what is now France, uh, even larger than the king's castle. Uh, the main tower was roughly uh, in the vicinity between 180 to 200 feet, depending on whether you, what you count as the tallest point, whether you're looking at the spires, which may have been added uh, later during the restoration um, by Villa Duke, but uh, the main idea is the this is going to be the lord of the territory, which we're going to call the Grand Duchy of uh, Greenvale. However, he has to share power with his sister, who we call the matriarch of Lawrence and Lawrence is going to be the the lawful god the main deity for this particular region and that is what we're going to use as a stand in for that is the um, the diocesan town of Long which is the capital of the arrondissement of Long and uh, it is also the seat of the bishop who was uh, also a noble uh, in this case we're, we're cutting that out but much like we talked about in york we're going to say that this um, religious leader who is the the nominal head of the city and the land around it uh, she has to share her power with uh, a mayor and alderman situation and the alderman and the mayor being drawn from the trades and occupations, uh, merchant guilds from around the city. And so there's a, a, a contentious power sharing arrangement going on just within the city. And then also the matriarch, who's the nominal head of this town that's based on Long is going to be vying for power with her brother who is the lord of the castle town uh, that's based on Kusi. And then what we're going to do after that is we'll also add a third major town which is based on La Fer. Um, La Fer is a town uh, that's situated at a favorable crossing of the Huis River and so We've got, it had, you know, walls and a fortified area, blah, blah, blah. So we're going to use that as the basis for our third major city. Now, um, I'm also putting in a couple of, um, one internal county and one external county that are going to be on this main map that's part of the neighboring territory. And we'll talk a little bit about that, though, once we start looking over the, um, the actual adapted campaign map that, and we'll talk a little bit about the adventures that we're going to go there so that'll be the next part before we get to the converted map that I've drawn I want to take a look at this historic topographic map to kind of give you an orientation about where we are so uh, you can see down in the bottom left hand corner where Kusi is that uh, we've now converted that to Corvesi and that's going to be the major castle in this particular grand duchy and it's also going to be where the grand duke spends most of his time although it's not the capital city of the territory now we go to, to the bottom right hand side where we see long is going to be converted into Kerlon 
and that is actually going to be the major city of the territory uh, at times when the Grand Duke needs to be involved with uh, administrative duties. Uh, a lot of times he can probably just send a representative to town, but when he has to be there, specific, you know, governmental issues, or if it's just, you know, an annual festival or something like that where he puts an appearance, he has his own quarters and, and stuff in, in the major town. But that is governed by his sister, who's the again the matriarch of Lawrence, and then also the civic government consisting of a mayor and 24 aldermen is the way we're going to work it. So there's a, a a group of 25 that shares power with the single cleric uh, slash noble woman. And then at the top edge of the map there, where La Fer uh, is in this region of France that we're converting. Uh, we've con we're going to make that the town of Ways Crossing. So the river then is actually where it would be Ways River uh, is now going to be the Ways River. And uh, although it's not shown here on the map, the Islet that is the river that runs along what's more or less the southern edge of the map that you're looking at here uh, is just going to become the Let River. And, uh, you know, that's not the only conversions we've made, but uh, that's what we'll look at as we go to the hand-drawn map next. All right, so for a final segment, we're going to take a look at, the, first of all, the campaign planning worksheet that we filled out for the quick PACE video, PACE being uh, Phase Alignment Conflict Environment. Excuse me, Yasmina. And uh, these are all the random rolls that we made for each of the 10 adventure arcs that would be contained in the single campaign. So um, ultimately the title of the campaign is going to be Titans Awake and ultimately, and it's going to revolve around uh, a couple of different things that have nothing to do with Titans. However, that's where it's probably all going to end up. And I say probably because you never know what the player is going to do that might in fact uh, move things in a different direction, but working backwards. We're probably gonna have Titans Giants enemy soldiers somewhere in the middle Goblin armies involvement and bandit rebel early on however uh, The way we got the roles You'll see the you know uh, at the top of each thing. That's the type of quest it is so a pickup quest or the achievement a goal or an achievement of some sort uh, the third quest will be a protection quest. Fourth quest will have to destroy something. The fifth quest will again be a protection quest. Uh, the sixth will be some sort of delivery. Seven is destroy something. Eight is an investigation quest. Nine will be a survival quest. And then the last one will involve primarily a, a diplomacy for the overall arc. Could you please not chew on that cord? Thank you so much. Now, uh, the next entry for each of the adventure arcs is the overall theme. And then the next three items are for each phase, uh, beginning, middle, and end, sort of what's going to be the major theme involved with that particular phase of play. And one of the things, I'm not going to go item by item, um, it will just take forever and it's already a very long video but what i want to mention is that there's a, a lot of things in here that have to do with kin it's self-sacrifice for kin it's uh, a lot of uh, slaying kin unrecognized is one of them uh, all sacrifice for kin is is like the very last entry for the 10th adventure arc so and just to open it up there's a, a vengeance in the middle phase that involves kin on kin. So now we're going to go to the map itself. So we've talked a lot about up to this point that we're, we're actually converting the Picardy region of France for use as an adventure setting. So we've introduced some of these new locations. This is now what is based on Cousy, but is actually going to be Corvessi. Uh, here we have Long, but that is actually going to be Kerlan. 
And then up here we have the fair, and that is actually going to be made into Ways Crossing. And um, some of the other towns, this is in Easy Le Chateau. Uh, this is going to be in the neighboring prelacy of Lorenz, and that's going to be a place called Pine Hill. But uh, what we got here is broken up into different regions. So in this area over here, we're going to have this under the control of the Lord of uh, Corvesi, and that is going to be the Grand Duke. Now, his castle is all the way down here with its associated town. There's also some other major towns in there, and he's got a couple of monasteries. Uh, this being an important monastery for the entire Grand Duchy, so there's some shared authority uh, between these two locations, going, you know, buying for control, uh, and then the abbey of this uh, uh, particular monastery is also uh, trying to get his own comeuppance, so there's a lot going on there, whereas this abbey is more directly associated uh, with the castle, and this abbey has its own thing going on too, uh, it's very closely tied with this walled town next to it. So, you can kind of see down here, We've uh, filled in all our map symbols as far as what they mean. We've added in some uh, neighboring areas, so the Kingdom of Severus. And actually, uh, the Grand Duchy and the Prelacy of Lorenz are all sort of subsumed under the Kingdom of Severus. However, they are sovereign territories, so the Grand Duke and over here, um, the Prelate, or the Prelacy of Lorenz is a... Uh, a religious state organization of its own right and uh, they're self-governing to us to most extent but they are um, client states of the kingdom of Savaras however up on the other side here this area is actually going to be part of the county of Amman Amien uh, which is, in turn is part of the Duchy of Rouen, Rouen and they're all going to be part of the kingdom of Numandy, Normandy, and uh, they are not related. So one of the things we'll find is like this little town up here, village, is uh, part of the territory of the Grand Duke. However, see, uh, very far away uh, in terms of being able to govern it. And so there might be some smuggling on this road over here, we'll say. But anyway, so essentially that is going to be the Grand Duke's territory. This uh, general area in here is all going to be part of um, the matriarch of Lorenz's territory, and, uh, ruling from Carillon along with the... Uh, like I said, a mayor and uh, 24 aldermen. Uh, they, the mayor and the aldermen really only have control within the city limits itself. And there's some other things that go along with that. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, these four hexes down here are actually going to be part of a county called Lime Hills. And uh, this area, so these are all kind of uh, chalk hills that are easily carved into, including these hills right here. However, um, these, this is a thick area of chalk, whereas this is just chalk mostly at the surface and has a much thicker deposit of the mineable fine grain limestone that's being used for building materials in all these locations. Uh, so a lot of where there's stone buildings, it's actually being mined out of here. Um, and then the last place we have up here is uh, what's now going to be um, Ways Crossing and the Ways River. This will be the Let River. And this is another walled town. And it's got an area that includes these villages here, but also these hexes down here. Um, there's mining that goes on in here. In fact, there's also hill dwarfs that live in this area. Uh, they're self-governing, but they do live in the area that is, uh, part of uh, this county up here. This county um, is going to be um, the uncle of the brother and sister here, and this county is going to be governed by um, what was now the 
the brother-in-law of these two, uh, and unfortunately, the 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 sister that he married is no longer around. But because they had children who will eventually take over the county, um, the governorship passed to uh, their brother-in-law. So they're all relatives, as you can tell. Since I got into this by talking about the fact that um, there's a lot of kin on kin strife that is a thread that goes through um, all the things that we randomly rolled as far as this worksheet. Um, but just some other things that are going on. So um, one, all these areas, uh, kind of the major crop that's going on up in here is going to be sugar beets. Uh, however, they all can grow um, down here in this area. Is, they do grow wheats and barleys and rye. Uh, up here, they actually uh, grow oats as a secondary crop. And this area does not have a lot of farming. It does grow some, uh, but not enough to supply its own food needs. However, it's a very mineral and uh, otherwise resource rich area. So um, they've got things that they can trade. And obviously they're all related because they're all part of the same Grand Duchy. They're just subdivisions of this Grand Duchy. And um, so some things that also are going on around here that I've uh, decided. Um, so one, um, this area has uh, a lot of apple orchards, and so they um, they use a lot. They drink a lot of cider, and they also drink uh, ale that is generally unhopped. Whereas this area is better known for wine production over in here, and they also make uh, a a type of hopped beer so it's beer and wine here it's a cider and ale here and nowhere in the grand duchy uh do any of these places have the right to uh make or drink uh hard spirits or liquor uh, however the rights to distill things like hard liquor do reside in the monasteries uh however they make it entirely for the consumption of uh the aristocracy, the nobles year round. However, commoners are permitted access to hard spirits during festival seasons. But uh, in this county, Lime Hills region, that's one of the things that's going on back in these hills, in, back in the town, is there are moonshiners that operate back there. And just some other notes um, this area has got uh, an infestation of troglodytes, and then it, more away from the river, we've got kobolds. Uh, the kobolds are actually operating at the surface. They're ultimately in service of a red dragon that uh, has a lair at depth, but uh, there's some different levels they have to get through to get down to that. And uh, there are also mountain dwarves that live up in this area, and then off to this northeast is also uh, where the giants are. And uh, also the, the goblin, hog goblin, and bugbear army that's going to come through. Um, things that are going on, I didn't mention as far as other polities in the area. So to the north, there's an area called the Springshire Baronies. And to the northeast, or east of the Springshire Baronies, there's the county of Hayborst. Uh, this is actually like the, uh, the Artois region of France, and then also um, uh, Nord Pas de Calais. Uh, kind of the coastal region at the very least, whereas this is more like uh, coastal Belgium. However, um, it's related to uh, uh, a sovereign prince that's uh, Lorenzburg that's basically going to be based on, you know, Belgium and Luxembourg. Uh, however, they're out of the way. But uh, just a note, uh, since I've mentioned a couple times that I don't use halflings in my own campaign world, in this campaign world, there are halflings. They just, uh, they live in a little subdivision of this county of Heborst. And uh, there are going to be um, high elves that live in this forest. There are sylvan elves that live in this forest. Uh, this is important because actually the elves, uh, the high elves at least, intervened and they're part of why there's this little reservation of uh, halflings that is able to exist up here in the county of Heborst. And so there's a lot of resentment against the, ha uh, the high elves. The sylvan elves generally stay out of that way and just enjoy a, a, a rural rustic 
life within the forest and they'd prefer not to have to interact with humans or other demi humans but uh you know of course they're surrounded by human territories so you know things go on in that forest um now the you know, just wrap this up by talking a little about oh before I go, also this major scarp here. So this stream that actually feeds into this massive lake, and eventually if you extended the map, there would be more stream over in this direction. Um, three million years before the present, it actually went out and joined the Waze River. About two million years before present, it was detoured back down into here or joined up with the let river and that's part of what created this thing called the escarpment so this area is you know you can see chalk hills but it's uh on its northeastern and eastern side it's bounded by this thing called the escarpment it's not a a, a continuous vertical rock face cliff by any means uh it's a very irregular kind of uh maybe a, a 60 degree slope for a lot of it and generally between let's say um, 20 and 60 feet in height so it's not massive you know sky touching cliffs or anything uh, these mountains are pretty large however um, they're more or less based on a combination of uh, the Ardennes wilderness uh, with a little bit of the Vosche Mountains uh, thrown into the mix. So a little bit uh, for people in the United States, like the Appalachian Mountains. And, um, you know, I don't want to have to give away every detail just to kind of talk about what all is going to go into this. But it, it suffices to say that we've got a 10 adventure arc. Uh, and so how it's going to break down as far as the you know, three or four adventures in an arc is um yeah, i mean it's not something i'm going to get into here but just to talk about it, the the first arc is going to focus kind of on um the power contest between this brother and sister the one the grand duke and the other one the matriarch of the lawful god and how they're kind of vying for power behind the scenes and the way that they entangle some of the other people within the grand duchy and that's going to gradually give way to um, some invasion of human forces uh, that come in from the northern area. So they, they're actually trying to encroach on this little county up here in the north. And it's not entirely clear which one of these neighboring territories it might be. Um, or if it's something else entirely that kind of gets broken up in the end as uh, a, a massive goblin hobgoblin bugbear army starts to threaten from the northeast uh, although that may not have fully resolved itself by the time that starts happening uh, and then in the end it will be uh, become clear that there are giants behind it and then ultimately it's going to become clear that behind that is a major titan of chaotic evil alignment and that's kind of one of the big driving forces um i mentioned the red dragon down here uh, subterranean lair in these hills there's also uh three fairly young green dragons living up in this forest area in here and then up in this swamp that surrounds this lake there is an adult black dragon uh so to kind of give you an idea what i'm talking about as far as those three arcs um, the major arcs, the buying of power between the two co, they're not really co-rulers, but they're, you know, co-powerful in a sense. Uh, they're equally powerful within the Grand Duchy. Uh, one is obviously a civic administrative ruler, the Grand Duke, and the other one is more of the religious ruler, but also the political controller, the de facto ruler of the, the capital city. So, you know, this is the capital here, not where the Grand Duke lives. He stays in his castle and only comes here when uh, there's administrative or festival functions, kind of that, where he needs to put an appearance in the main town. And uh, I think that's probably quite a bit of detail, maybe even more than I planned on giving. But it gives you an idea of, you know, what I'm planning for. But now the last thing I do want to touch on is, as far as those arcs, those are not quests that are they're not adventures 
So they don't break down like, okay, there's that's not going to be adventure 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, they're kind of like, the uh, as I've said before, it, it's the things that are going on in the background. These are what, you know, the milieu within which the character is going to have to make their choices. The actual adventures are going to be the things that they choose to do through the relationships they make with the people involved with all those stories, or if they just find things like caves that lead down into a dragon's lair, or if they go off for, into a foray into the forest and find dragons, you know, whether that's the forest dragons or the swamp dragon up there. So... Or they go off into the, these mountains looking for the mountain dwarves and find earlier evidence of the giant's involvement with the goblin army. Uh, it can go any way that the party chooses. Those are actually going to be the adventures that they go on. It's just that there's, in the background, these sort of, this, this sequence of ten sort of themes or thematic threads that run through the background that are sort of driving the action by everybody other than the players uh, and that's really the point i want to make is that what i'm doing is not writing a campaign of 10 modular adventures i'm writing a campaign with sort of 10 currents of adventure that are going on um in the background and players can either pick up on those threads or not to suit themselves now if they don't end up kind of pulling at the threads that are exposed when they are in certain areas eventually you know the the giant army is and is going to push through with all their goblins and everything else that they have at their disposal and it's going to become rather obvious that you either deal with that threat or you know the grand duchy gets overrun which the players could let happen it's all choices that they're free to make anyway uh that's probably enough it's going to be over an hour as it is already um so i'll let it drop here and i thank you very much for putting up with this long video and watching or even if you did so at double speed or you know skip through the various things or watch it a little bit at a time uh, and i really hope to see you again at the next one thank you very much